with Patrick D. McCoy. I am pleased to introduce to you our guest for today. Soprano Lisette Oropesa was recently named as the winner of the 2019 Richard Tucker Foundation Award. She stars in major productions across the world and has garnered acclaim in Include such luminaries as Stephanie Blythe, Lawrence Brownlee, Joyce DiDonato, Renee Fleming, Christine Girk, Matthew Ponzani, and Deborah Voyer. Orpeza was inducted into this who's who of American opera at the Foundation's annual gala on Sunday, October 27th at Carnegie Hall. She chats today about her career winning the award and her upcoming appearance in D.C. with Washington Concert Opera and their performance of Hamlet by Ambra Thomas on Sunday, November 24th at George Washington University's Listen Auditorium. Without further ado, good afternoon, Lisette. Good afternoon, Lisette. Hello, Patrick. How are you? Oh, my goodness. It is such an honor to have you on today for this installment of the Opera Diva series. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me today. It's a pleasure to talk and, to you. And congratulations on winning the 2000, 2019 Richard Tucker Foundation Award. I'm sure <laughs> that is a huge honor in your book. Uh. Yeah, it's a really, a really huge honor. They only give it to one singer a year, and I'm really, really, really fortunate that I was chosen as this year's recipient. I'm really grateful to the Tucker Foundation. Listen, we're going to come back to that, but I definitely want to jump right in. You're going to be coming to Washington, D.C. at the end of this month to appear with Washington Concert Opera, but you're no stranger to Washington because if I recall, you were in Lenox de Figaro back in 2016 with Washington National Opera. So you're, you're, you're going to be right at home here in our nation's capital. Yes, I love singing in Washington. I think it's one of the most beautiful cities in the whole world and one of the most beautiful American cities. And it's a really extraordinary kind of group of, of uh, opera fans that are in Washington, very astute listeners and very, very kind and generous audience. So, And I've sung there several times. I've debuted several roles in Washington. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to coming back and doing that again. That's amazing. So talk. To, let's jump right back into Washington Concert Opera. Talk about mm -hmm. your your role in this production of Hamlet, and uh, you know this this character of Ophelia that you're gonna portray. Yeah. Well, you know the French uh, version of Hamlet, the French opera version of Hamlet. The big primary difference between I think that people will notice between the opera and the play is that Hamlet does not die at the end. <laughs> Um, and I hate to give away the ending, but um, it, at the time, at the time, it was kind of considered vulgar to kill off the hero uh, in French opera, even though, you know, it's it's based on a famous Shakespearean tragedy. So it's really interesting to see how the play gets a bit rewritten towards the end. But a lot of the major elements about the play are still in the opera, are still in the music. And Ophelia, the famous part, the most famous part of the music, and even in really the play in a lot of ways, is that Ophelia has this mad scene. And she kind of comes out, and it's basically one of the last times that you see her before she drowns. Uh, before she dies. And in the opera, she comes out and sings this incredible coloratura showcase. It's probably one of the most difficult um, pieces I've ever learned. I actually used to sing the, the aria uh, as a Lindman young artist. Like I studied it uh, and used it in auditions and stuff because it's really impressive, but it's also extremely <laughs> difficult to sing because mm. it goes high, it goes low, and mad scenes have every extreme. Um, and so Thomas wrote this beautiful showcase for the soprano. Um, in in the baritone's opera, you know, because the yeah, Hamlet is is a baritone, but um, it's it's very rewarding to sing the music. And there's a gorgeous scene after the mad scene where she drowns. The music, it's all in the music, and it's the some of the most sublime things ever put on paper. And that you can listen to it is you literally hear the waves overtaking her and her drowning in the water. It is the most sad, gorgeous. I mean, bring your Kleenex, really. I mean, it's such a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful piece. 
<laughs> now, talk to me about how you make the transition. You're you're performing this in a concert um, setting. How do you get yourself uh, in the mood to embody this character without having the the props and the set and all of that? Can you kind of talk to the lifter? Like, how do you really uh, put yourself in that mindset without the the scenery and the, maybe the costumes of a stage opera? That's a really great question, Patrick. Uh, and actually, Hamlet, I think, is in a lot of ways better served with a production because it's based on a play. Um, and there's a lot of music in it that you hear it feels like a lot of action needs to be happening. Um, you know, because there's the, the the ghost and there's, you know, the, the, the play, the play within the play that Hamlet does put on for the king uh, and, and for the court. And so in a lot of ways, you really have to, as an audience member, you have to kind of close your eyes and imagine it and just let the music kind of take you. It's a bit of a Fantasia experience, if you will. But mm. for us as performers, um, I'm lucky that I've sung the role in a production before. So I have a little bit of a uh, foundation in my head of what you know, is basically happening as far as what might be, what an audience, what might be on stage if this were a production. But I think that the key in a concert performance of any opera is to let the text and, and the voices and the music kind of speak for themselves and not to overact them because we're just kind of standing there. I mean, we're not going to be running around semi-blocked unless I, we get there and everyone feels inspired to kind of semi-block it but um <laughs> <laughs> you know that could happen that does happen sometimes you'll get in a situation where it's just you know it just i don't feel right standing and just singing this can i walk around you know can i relate to the other characters because that for sure will happen we'll relate to each other i mean we're not just gonna like concertate the whole thing we are gonna relate to each other <clears throat> But there's only so much space that we have, you know, because we're going to be on stage with the orchestra. So we have to have it all. Everything has to be kind of condensed to our facial expressions, uh, you know, minimal gestures and our voices really are, our, 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 you know, our singing it has to speak for itself. And that's a challenge. That's a challenge. <laughs> in, in terms of relating, you mentioned about uh, relating to the character. How much of this character do you see maybe in yourself? Not a whole lot, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, to be honest, I mean, she is. Um, she feels a bit helpless because she she tries to, at least in the opera, she tries very much to, and the play too. She tries very much to reach Hamlet when he starts playing his little games of I'm going to pretend like I'm going crazy and make everybody. Uh, not have no idea what what's going on in my mind right now because you know he's in mourning he's dealing with his mom marrying his uncle he's dealing with all kinds of issues mommy issues and and personal issues about his own uh, needs and desires and and his father wanting him to 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 murder his uncle he's got a lot of issues and she is is kind of this you know she's they've had this relationship in the past. And he suddenly just kind of does this 180 on her and doesn't explain to her anything. So he, she wants communication and he does not give it to her. Um, and so there's a scene, actually, a really sad scene um, earlier in the opera where she's pretending like she's reading and she's reading this book out loud. And what she's saying in the book is, it seems like you don't love me anymore. I don't know why you're not talking to me. What's going on? Because she can't even bring herself to say that to him directly. And he completely does not respond to her. He does not even open his mouth and say one word. And that is the most hurtful thing you can do to a person who's your lover or, you know, to just not communicate with them. So that's kind of what the relationship struggles from. And that's why she kind of goes crazy because, I mean, depending on how you want to interpret it, um, some, some interpretations I've read or heard that she may be pregnant, um, that she may have, uh, that she's been hiding this secret, you know, about being pregnant and that that's actually why she drowns herself. Uh, and it depends on who you ask, <clears throat> because apparently, like in Elizabethan times, the drowning of a woman was because of her being pregnant. Uh, I have an interpretation that I actually think Hamlet's mother may have had something to do with her death, may have had something. But that's all mystery. And that's all, you know, you know, it, it depends on the director, it depends on how it's all put together. But I think, you know, do I relate to her? No, because I mean, I, I've never been through that. <laughs> I've never been through that, you know, I, I've never been pregnant. I've never had that struggle of, oh my God, you know, it's a little bit Marguerite in Faust too, you know, I mean, she does get pregnant, you know, with a man, you know, from a man that, that, 
can't can't relate to her on the right level anymore. Uh, you know, we see this character that kind of thing some, a lot in in opera, where a woman is trying to communicate with a man. We see it in the in uh, the Magic Flute. Woman trying to communicate with a man. Man refuses to speak. Woman gets upset. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> my man talks to me. My man knows he got to talk to me. So. <laughs> That's what we try to work on these days, you know. Well, listen, just a sidebar. Speaking of your man talking to you, I must say, you know, I love social media, and I love the fact that you're on social media. So I did see one of your videos. Could you maybe share with the listeners? Well, I saw a video. You had to go get a visa, and you and your husband were in the car. Could you maybe share about that little fun debacle about your visa? Oh, my God. Listen, I, yes. I mean, I've had that happen so many times. I can't even tell you that I, if you, whenever you go to sing in the Schengen zone in Europe, which is several countries, and it's the ones that primarily employ us, uh, we have to go and get a visa from our local consulate. Now, you guys are fortunate in Washington, D.C., you got consulates everywhere. But for those of us yeah. who live in other parts of the country that aren't so close to a consulate, so I live in, in Baton Rouge, my local consulate is in Houston, Texas. So I have to get myself over to Houston, Texas, which is a five-hour drive or a flight of some kind to go and make an appointment at a consulate early in the morning because they only operate from like 9 a.m. to like 11 a.m. I mean, look, and it is just, a, and you have to appear in person and all this stuff has to happen at a certain time window before you go and work. I mean, these are one of the nuts and bolts of the career that nobody tells you about that later once you start working, you go, oh my God, I run into this all the time. And it's a bit of an inconvenience, um, you know, and I don't want to get political, especially with your listeners there in Washington, but you know, it's one of the things, one of the problems with borders is that every time you, right. you want to spread out, you know, you want to employ people from different parts of the world. I mean, opera is an international art form. It's not big enough to only be local. It's it's very it's very um uh you know it's a very small subset of people that specialize in this craft. But if you have opera houses all over the world, you know every single country has its own laws, and we all have to abide by those laws. So we all start getting kind of filtered around left and right. Uh, yes, yeah, so it could be a frustrating inconvenience. I probably got on Instagram and made all kinds of, of brouhaha, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I enjoyed watching that video. I said, so when you mentioned about, you know, having a conversation with your husband, I thought, oh, yeah, you all had plenty of time to talk when you all were in that car on that five-hour drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we're, we have, I have a very, very uh, beautiful relationship with my husband who is who's very supportive and and everything he does is the opposite of what I do we are complete opposites in every way because I'm the artsy one and the, the musical one and the verbal one and he's mechanical and he's logical and he's uh you know business minded and he kind of has that aspect altogether. so when we when we talk, there's always stuff to talk about because we we have different viewpoints on so many things and different expertises. So we're always talking. It's really kind of amazing, actually. That's fantastic. I love each other. I want <laughs> I want to go back to uh, the Richard Tucker War because I know that was such a festive, momentous kind of time for you. So I want to go mm. back. Um, to the the excitement and the euphoria of the evening, could you maybe talk about how did you feel in that moment when they said Lisette Oropesa is the winner? Mm -hmm. Well, I got a phone call before then at mm. midnight. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was in I was in Barcelona in in Spain working on an, an opera there. I was singing a title, making my debut in a Handel opera called Rodelinda. And, oh. you know, it's not it's not an easy role. It is very long. It's very taxing production. I was on stage almost the whole time. So I was really working very hard. And I get this phone call at, like, midnight. And I'm, like, and I'm looking at my phone, and I see this in New York City. I was, like, okay, it's, you know, in, in midnight in, in Europe is still the after the evening in, in the East Coast, right? So I pick up the phone. Listen, this is Barry Tucker. I was, like, R really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> hello? Uh, you know, and I thought, okay, I mean, look, I've, I've, I've been associated with the Tucker Foundation for years and years and years. So hearing from Barry is not like a weird thing or anything, but I was just kind of like, huh, okay, hi, yes, I just want to let you know that you're this year's recipient of the Richard Tucker Award. And I said, Barry, are you sure you got the right phone number? <laughs> and he says, yes. 
Yes, we we want to. You know, we we we're so happy to 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 pick you this year. You know, you've been selected. You were unanimously voted to to be the winner this year. And I was like, Perry. I, at, at first, I didn't believe him. I was like, I couldn't even. I was like, wow. Thank you. I mean, you know, when you, something kind of hits you that you completely out of left field, you like a little unconscious for a second, and then it you it all oh, kind of comes yeah. together. That's what happened. Because at the time, I had been. I mean, the Tucker Award is every year, and I thought really it was for somebody uh, slightly, maybe slightly younger than me, or slightly less, um, kind of with a little bit shorter of a resume. Let's just put it that way, because I mean, the Tucker Award is supposed to be. Oh, I thought for years that it was supposed to be kind of a boost award for somebody who is just on the verge of starting their international career, and my career has been international for the majority of its existence, you know, um, and I started very young. So I, I kind of thought, okay, well, the Tucker Award, you know, I, they would give it to somebody a little less busy, I suppose, who really needs the money. Um, but that's not what he said. He said, no, 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 you know, um, I mean, I'm being perfectly honest. I just didn't think it was ever going to come to me. I, or I thought I was, I was past it. I thought I wouldn't, you know, they would give it to somebody who really needs the money. Um, I hate to say that, but you know what I mean? It's more of, because it, it seems like, a prize that big, you know, because it's fifty thousand dollars. I mean, everybody knows that it's fifty thousand dollars, and a prize that big, you know, could really help somebody who is at a point in their career when they just don't have their calendar full yet, and that kind of money is really needed at that time, you know. Um, and that's who they have been kind of giving it to were people who were just at that time when that extra 50,000 made the difference between them being able to have a full calendar's worth of work or them being able to maybe, you know, do some auditions, some extra auditions or, or whatever. Um, anyway, so I, I kind of said to him, I was like, wow, okay, I appreciate that because I really thought, you know, um, you guys are giving it to different types of singers. And he said, no, 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 you know, we, we're really proud of you for having your international kind of work that you've got going on. And we really support you. And, and we really want you to, to be the winner this year. And, you know, and I was like, wow, well, thank you. I mean, I, what am I going to say? You know, I, I, all I could say was thank you. And, and I hung up the phone and I just kind of sat there and I was just like, wow, you know, I mean, so you never really know who's going to get it because every year everybody tries to guess who's going to be the next winner, you know, and, and sometimes it's, it's, it's a person that we all, I mean, there are people that I think long overdue should have won the award years ago, not me, that are other people, you know, that are several people. I mean, there's so many American artists that need it and deserve it, you know, so I, I wish they could give more than one award a year, <laughs> you know, if I, if I had my way, that's what they would do, you know, anyway, so I'm grateful to have it. It was very unexpected. That's fantastic. Well, that just that just goes to show you that you're in your season. It was your season mm -hmm. to get it. So I just want to say congratulations again to you Thanks. on that. Thank now, you. I just want to take it back, take it back a little bit further, you know, because for some people listening, uh, this may be their first time being exposed to you. And it's an opportunity where somebody can be inspired. They might want to say, hey, I want to be an opera singer. So I want you to take me back to Louisiana and just oh. uh, kind, of, kind of walk me back to um, when did you catch the, the singing bug? How, how did you come to know, hey, I want to be a singer? Well, my mom is a singer. And my grandpa had a beautiful, has had a beautiful voice. Um, and I grew up with in a musical household. So I kind of, I, my mom was a, an opera singer, actually. Like she, she's trained as a, as a vocalist and played the piano, but has a performance degree. And I, so I was, I was born kind of into it. I was born hearing it. I was born, you know, hearing my mother's beautiful voice. My mom was the most gorgeous voice you can't even imagine how amazing my mom is and I thought that that you know hearing her sing like that I thought you know that was common I had no idea that opera was so rare <laughs> until I kind of started going to school and would sing you know for my friends with my friends and I sang kind of the way my mom sang which was in a classical type of voice and everybody thought I sounded so funny and I remember you know uh, kids were fascinated hearing me sing because I sounded um I guess I don't want to say developed, but I, I sounded like a person who had been hearing classical singing for a long time, I suppose you could say. And I started doing little voice competition, little talent shows and stuff when I was little, and I used to win all the time. And so singing was like part of my life since I was very small. It was always the way that I got, um, what's the word, affirmation 
from people and positive uh, encouragement from people. You know, some people get encouragement for being, uh, you know, wonderful athletes. Or some people get encouragement for being wonderful artists. Some people get encouragement for being funny and being having great personalities. And, you know, oh, so-and-so, tell us a joke. You know, mine was, my encouragement was, well, set, get up here, sing for us, you know, my whole life. Uh, but I, I didn't, when I kind of started growing up, I didn't want to do what my mom was kind of wanting to do my mom always wanted to be a singer always dreamed of it but she ended up uh, becoming a teacher because she had three kids and she felt that it was the more solid way to support us so she became a music teacher but opera was always kind of her thing her dream I didn't want to do that I was like you know it's my mom's dream I, I want to find my own dream and so I started playing the flute which was my favorite instrument at the time and still is and I, I loved it and I just put all my heart and soul into the flute but I never really stopped singing um I didn't, I wasn't in choir or anything. I was in band, but I always sang in church. Oh, every week of my life for basically my entire life since I, since as early as I can remember, I've been singing in church. And I really think, and especially in the South anyway, church is an extremely important part of, um, of life, uh, of, you know, I mean, I grew up basically in the Bible Belt, you know, I mean, it, it's a very big part of the culture down here. Uh, but it's also, it nurtures a musical spirit. I have to say, even if you, whether you believe it or not, it it was where I had the chance to sing, to to praise, to you know, to use my voice in a way that that was beyond just singing pop on the radio, you know, with something else, you know. So, uh, and my mom grew up in the church too, so it was one of those things that, you know, um, I'm just I'm grateful that I had that that upbringing and that really strong encouragement my whole life. And then when I ended up when I went to college, I you know, I was going to study flute, but my mom was like, well, set, <laughs> she's always right. Right. You know, she's like, set, I really think you need, you need to sing for them and let them hear you, the voice, let the voice faculty hear you, because I really think that, you know, you, you could be an opportunity to be a really great one because I, you know, she just thought I had a knack. She thought I had a performance you know, that I was a good performer and that I would like being on stage and I like speaking different languages and all that stuff. She's like, well, that, you're, it's made for you. And, and you know, and I, all right, all right. So to make her happy, I sang this audition for LSU, for the, the university here. And they were like, oh, yes, no, you absolutely have to sing. No, 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 you have to sing. And and it was kind of like, but I want to play flute. I've been playing for all these years. That's what I want to do. No, yeah, but no, but yeah, but, you know, your voice <laughs> – the, let's just say the voice faculty was more excited about me than the flute faculty was, you know, I, I, oh. I kind of, yeah. I mean, the flute faculty was very kind to me, but they were like, you know, I didn't make the top ensemble. Like I auditioned and I didn't make the top ensemble. I didn't make the top studio. I got in, but it wasn't like, you know, whereas the voice faculty was like top ensemble, top studio, you know, I, they, they were like, you know, really, really enthusiastic. So I, I took a semester to do both because I really was hoping that, you know, I could, I could be in the orchestra. I would love playing an orchestra, but it just, just not what my, was my destiny. So I, I ended up um, uh, dropping, you know, my major in flute and, and continuing on as a, as a voice major. And now I'm so glad that I, that I had that whole experience. Like it was now I'm completely 100% devoted to, to this life and this work as an opera singer. But if it hadn't been for flute playing, I don't think I would appreciate the musicianship that it takes to be a singer as much. You know what I mean? Like being an instrumentalist taught me something else, something separate. Yeah, and really also appreciate. it's like you're not just a singer. You're a singer who's aware of what's going on in the orchestra. So you can mm -hmm. sing and be intelligently aware of, you know, where this instrument comes in. You you have, a, you know what I'm saying? You mm -hmm. have a more of a sense yeah. of the orchestral um, aspect of it because you are an instrumentalist also. So that's, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, I think so I think a lot of singers are instrumentalists too, and it makes a difference. It does. Yes, it, it does. <laughs> and speaking of singers and speaking of mm -hmm. voices, I want to treat our listeners to your voice of you oh, singing yeah. Mozart's Aben Findu.
Beautiful. Nothing like a little Mozart in the afternoon. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for playing that. That's that's one of my favorite art songs. It's a real, I love Mozart <laughs> so much. So now I want to kind of talk, we kind of alluded to this when I mentioned the, the road trip that you and your husband had because I saw it on social media. And you know, you have a lot of uh, young people, a lot of young artists in particular who also use social media. Could you maybe talk about like the role of social media? How do you uh, use social media? What's the best way that you use social media to share about your life and, and your career? Well, I think social media is, in a lot of ways, what has helped bring uh, more interest to opera from young people because it's made it's made it just more available, you know, because if you post a clip, you know, or a video or something of you singing or some music of a performance that you're in, a lot of people get to hear it. And I think, you know, people are, are moved by, by the human voice. And, you know, it's one thing when something's on TV, you can't reach out to that person who you see singing on TV and tell them how, how much you enjoy their performance. But on social media, you can. You can go to that person's website. You can go to that person's uh, Instagram or their Facebook and message them and say, hey, you know, I saw your performance of this and this, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And it just makes this immediate sense of communication really easily available to us. You know, and I, I've always... Uh, kept a very uh, honest presence on social media, you know, that when people write to me, I write back uh, for the most part, as many as I can anyway. I mean, I'm get, sometimes I get a flood, floods of messages that I can't always respond, but I try really hard to, to check every comment and, and read everything because I do get lots of messages from, you know, young artists and young singers who, who are looking for advice or who, who want, you know, have questions about things that they just don't feel comfortable talking to their teachers about or to their director or whatever, you know, and people, people want, you know, people want to know, you know, uh, and so I, I make myself as available as I can with social media and, and I, we run it all ourselves. I mean, my husband and I, my husband created my website, but he also runs and manages my, my major social media platforms, but I read them and am very active on them. You know, I mean, I feel like, it's a double-edged sword. Of course, there are always negative things that come from social media because everybody can communicate and say whatever they think to everyone, to anyone, anytime. And we get all those messages, you know, um, but it's just one of, it's, it's either that or you cut off communication completely. So it's like either you're open to everything or you're open to nothing. And I, I could, you know, turn over my social media to a, a team of people that aren't me. Uh, but I don't want to do that. I feel like, I, first of all, I'm not, famous enough that I need to do that but um second of all I just feel like I, I feel like for as long as possible uh if people feel like they want to talk to me and ask me something I want to be open because that's who I am you know I'm not I don't put on an air of something that I'm not I mean my Instagram feed is myself you know like somebody was asking me specifically about my Instagram feed um, they were like, you know, I noticed that your Instagram is kind of a mix. Like you have pictures of yourself, like, you know, in performance and pictures of yourself in a nice gown. We also have pictures of yourself, like sweaty and no makeup with your hair up from running, you know, and, and you're okay with posting that. Like, I can't believe you're okay with posting that. I'm like, of course I'm okay with posting that. Why would I not post that? That's part of my life. You know, I, I don't feel like ashamed of posting a picture of myself, not looking my best, you know, or, or whatever, but I feel like it's important to share everything that goes into this work, you know, cause it's not just glamorous singing and nice g cocktail parties and gowns and makeup and events, you know, sometimes it's, it's blood and sweat, you know, and, and I feel like it's, there are people that are reached by that. And I feel like those are the people that, you know, reach out to me and, and I try to be there for them. And that's it. As we wrap up, th that certainly provides the per perfect segue and in, in, into our um, closing thoughts or, or the closing thoughts that I have. Um, and that's uh, emerging artists. As I mentioned, you know, this is a truly a blessing to have this conversation with you because I think it's inspirational when, when people, particularly the people who are starting out in this art form, they can see somebody they can relate to, they see them on social media, you know, they, they have a presence in that way. So um, with that being said, what would be some advice to somebody uh, who's starting out and they say, hey, I want to be an opera singer. What would be something, mm -hmm. maybe one of the first things you would share with them? Well, 
I think in a lot of ways, opera chooses us more than we choose it. Um, you know, if you're a singer, if you have a voice, you know. It's one of those things that you know from a time that you're very young. Almost nobody wakes up at age 18 and figures out that they have a voice. Most people have, who, be, who become singers have had a voice their whole life or have had a voice that they've known at least since childhood. So it's like if you feel that in your heart, if you know in your heart that you're a singer, that you are, that, you know, because there will probably be a lot of people, a lot of people telling you, don't do that. <laughs> don't sing. It's a waste of your time. It's not going to pay the bills. You will hear that. Um, try to find the people who encourage you. And if that's, you know, reaching out via social media to people who do sing and who do perform for a living, then do it, you know, and find out what their path was. And, and, you know, um, I mean, the path is different for everybody because some people go, go through school and come out on the other end with a career. Some people go through school and come out on the other end with nothing. And and there are people who, who never really go to school, but who are just really supremely gifted and meet the right person at the right time and begin working. I mean, there are a hundred different avenues to arrive at an operatic career. But I feel like in general, you know, I went to school, I went to university, you know, state, Louisiana State University, I didn't go to a big conservatory or anything. But I studied music, you know, and studying music is, is the start, you study music, and you get music into your life and bring music into your life as much as you can. And then you you get with a teacher and you talk to your teacher and you start singing auditions and you start learning your languages and it'll all kind of piece itself into into a you know the formula if you will for for that for that result which is to have a career and you know I always feel like if you you shop around schools you shop around universities and you find which ones have a good music program and you reach out to people who've maybe gone there and see what their experience is like and find a teacher you know that that will work with you and you know it it, it takes years it really does but but it's one of those things that little by little, it, it will start to form itself in your life, if that's, especially if that's your destiny. You know, you can't avoid, I really believe that. I believe that you cannot avoid your destiny if you tried. <laughs> if, if you are meant to be to sing, you will sing. If you are not meant to sing, you will not sing. <laughs> you know, I always feel like something, you know, so, but if you know, it does the thing, we all know. We all know. We just got to follow your heart. You got to follow your instinct and hope, you know, hope for the best and, and try to stay positive because there will be, there will be wrenches thrown into the mix sometimes but if if you know in your heart that that's your destiny just go for it. go keep going it will happen because it, it's, it's meant that, for you it will happen <laughs> that is so true now <laughs> once you leave washington what's up next on your plate what is the next big thing a- ahead of you once you leave washington well I get to go to Paris uh, and sing the Barber of Seville, sing the Rosina in the Barber of Seville, which is the first role I sang in college. So I haven't sung that role since I was a college student. Oh my so I, have to, I gotta learn it again because I forgot to learn. But no, actually, <laughs> I remember. I remember almost everything. It's crazy that really the stuff you learn early on. At least for me, the stuff I learned early on, I never forgot. So I just have to refresh my memory a little bit. But uh, Rosina, it'd be my first professional time singing singing this role. Wow. You know, yeah. But I, I really love the opera. The Barbara Seville is a masterpiece, as I'm sure you know, and I'm sure <clears throat> everyone. It's a comedy, and it's fun and it's a fabulous production and I love Paris. I mean, Paris is a dream. So I mean, yeah, so I'll be there all all throughout the holidays and all over the course of the new year. I'm singing a recital too uh in Switzerland in Gestadt um right after the new year. Uh and it's the same program that I sang last night. Actually I had a recital last night here in New Orleans, in my hometown, and then I'm gonna sing that same recital in Switzerland. So uh yeah, so a little foot on both coasts, if you will. That is so fascinating, especially your full circle moment. I mean, that goes to show that the hard work that you put in it has come to fruition. So hearty oh, congratulations. That is, that's amazing. Thank you, Patrick. I really, you're so kind. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Let's say you have been an absolute joy. I'm so glad, again, that you are on this installment of the Opera Diva series. And I just want to remind the listeners, again, that you will appear with Washington Concert Opera, on November 24th, 2019 at 6 o'clock p.m. at George Washington University's Lisbon Auditorium in Hamlet under the baton of Anthony Walker. Again, thank you so much for joining us today, Lisette. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I can't wait to get to Washington. I'm so looking forward to it. Can't wait. 
Do you have any final words for the listeners? Oh, I don't know. Go vote. <laughs> <laughs> what about your social media? You had mentioned your social media handles oh, and your website. Yeah. Where can people connect with you at? Well, there's only one Lisette or a Pesta in the whole world, I think. So if you look me up on Google, you'll find all my information. But my, my Instagram is Lisette underscore or a Pesta. Uh, but my Facebook, I have a, there's a fan club there that some little, uh, some fans run for me. But I also have a professional Facebook page that you can find me on absolutely. And I respond to 90% of my messages. So I, I, uh, I encourage everyone to reach out if, you know, and I just thank anybody who follows me. I've got a wonderful, wonderful group of people who are, who followed me for years and I'm so grateful. So thank you. Again, thank you listeners for tuning in to the Opera Diva series and interview with Soprano, the set or a the 2019 Richard Tucker Foundation Award winner. We are so fortunate to have her on today, and we thank you, and we look forward to have you on for our next broadcast on Across the Arts. I'm your host, Patrick D. McCoy. <laughs>